So from a young age, I felt like I learned the value of money and what hard work was. The, the, the restaurant was hard work. My dad and I would work really long hours and it would be hard and it was a proper, a proper family run restaurant. You didn't have an abundance of staff running around. It was, you did it to the minimum staff for maximum profit. And when it was good, it was really good. And then it got to a stage where it was really difficult and, and life just became really difficult. So I learned again from a young age what hardship felt like and what a failing business looked like and the stress that I could see my dad was under and kind of just learned from, from what was going on around him as well. And just from, from there, just decided business was going to be what I wanted to go into and never work for, for anyone on a nine to five. Hey, 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 welcome to the Wealth and Business Podcast. On this episode, I'm joined by a very good friend, someone over the last 12 months, we have basically built relationship and to cross-pollinate and also support one another in our very amazing entrepreneurial environment and as well as business environment. And we share some deep thoughts around wealth creation, around mindset, around even race and ethnicity in the business world. And... Paul is the founder of the events called The Peak Performance, and as well as he's the founder of the Casita Property Enterprise, focuses on helping uh, individuals do below market deals and also bring below market deals to the investor uh, market. So without further ado, welcome, Mr. Paul. Paul Stipperton, welcome to the Wealth and Business Podcast. How are you doing today, bro? I'm good. I'm good. Glad to be here as well. You know, it's quite interesting that how we met and how we've connected and how we've gone out to do so many things. We've got, you know, you speaking in one of our events upcoming as a guest and basically we're local in Bromley. You're doing amazing yeah. things. You're, you know, the co-founder and business partner with the Peak Performance. Mm -hmm. It's been a, a, you know, a massive, massive community for entrepreneurs and people who are looking to just make that transition. What's your story? Um, well, without the whole rags to riches story, um, grew up in um, not a great area, um, not too far from here. Uh, Mum and dad working all the hours under the sun. Um, my dad buying a business when it was doing really well and then certain things coming into play which then made that business not do so well, nearly losing the family home. And um, we moved to a better area, better circle of friends, better circle of people around us. And I, I guess I just I just had the the drive to want to be successful from a young age. Didn't know what I wanted to do, but knew I wanted to be a business owner and and, and be as successful as I possibly could. I was reading something. A couple of days ago, you and your business partner said you have a projection of, a, of one of your businesses that is projected to be valued over twenty million, twenty five million pounds by twenty before twenty thirty. Yeah, and I was very blown away with that because I know we've had a, a couple of chats here and there. You're in property, you're also a speaker, and you're very local in Bromley here, and a, a lot of people you know, probably don't know how, you know, how to make that massive transition when you, when you start from that bottleneck, right? You start from that bottom, you don't know where you're going, but you, you have a burning desire. And you said just now, you're, you, you, you were from a very rough part, mm -hmm. you know, not too far from here where we, where we not live and where we work from, you know, you have a fantastic, you know, business environment around you. So just kind of looking backwards, you know, and looking at that journey, because obviously the Wealth and Business Podcast is all about talking about that transition mm -hmm. from the ordinary to the extraordinary, from nothing to something. Yes, absolutely. The rack to riches, but I know you, you, you mentioned without the racks and riches story. Yeah, yeah. Because whether you're already up there and whether you're just here starting, regardless, you, we, we want to connect with both people. So whether you're up here, there's going to be some value for you to add. And I, I recently listened to Rich, Sir Richard Branson mm -hmm. and, you know, he was interviewed by, uh, you know, the diary of the CEO, Stephen Burlett. 
And I listened to him from when his business has almost failed a couple of times to literally building it up. Yeah, because the, the fact is, without that story of the ordinary to the extraordinary, mm. you can't get nowhere. And what keeps you humble as well as, a, as an individual is you reminding yourself where you've come from. Yeah. Because where, where you've come from is what keeps you humble. Definitely. You know, so the fact is, how did it begin and when did you catch that light bulb moment? Yeah. For success. So I've I worked from a really, really young age. Um, my dad had a restaurant, so I used to work in the restaurant quite a lot. I also used to work um, on a market on a weekend as well from the Sunday age of market? 14. Sorry? Sunday market? No, it was a Saturday actually. Um, and that was in Essex, so um, Dagnum and South End Market. And that, that kind of taught me what hard work was because... You would get up at five o'clock, be picked up at half five, drive all the way there. It'd be freezing cold and you'll be putting these stands together, cold iron bars together. And then <laughs> you're out there all day selling and people trying to hustle you down and then pack it up, get home at maybe eight o'clock. And I'd come home and I would have earned 35 pounds. And I'd think, yeah, it's good money. I mean, like now I'd look at it and I'd think, God, I wouldn't even get out of bed for that. But back then it made me realize like how valuable the money that you earn was. And I, I would always look at it and think like when I went out and I saved for like three or four weeks worth of money to go out and buy like a Machino shirt to go out. And that shirt was like gold to me. It was like the most valuable thing because I paid for it out of my hard blood, sweat and tears. Mm. Whereas probably if that was bought for me as a Christmas present by my parents, it probably wouldn't have held that same value. Yeah. So from a young age, um, I felt like I learned the value of money and what hard work was. The The, the restaurant was hard work. Um, my dad and I would work really long hours and it would be hard and it was a proper, a proper family run restaurant. You didn't have an abundance of staff running around. It was you did it to the minimum staff for maximum profit. And when it was good, it was really good. And then it got to a stage where it was really difficult and things like cause the smoking ban came in. Um, you live in you live in Bromley, but permits at lunchtime are an absolute nightmare. So we lost all of our lunch trade and life just became really difficult. So um, I learned again from a young age what hardship felt like and what a failing business looked like and the stress that I could see my dad was under and kind of just learned from from what was going on around him as well and just from from there just decided business was going to be what I wanted to go in to and never work for for anyone on a nine to five wow so you never worked for anyone Nine to five. How long has that been that you never really worked for someone nine to five? Well, I would say the the only job I've done where I've physically worked for someone would have been on the market. Mm. Outside of that, I've always been an independent consultant effectively and I've gone into businesses and I've worked on commission basis or I've had my own companies. But I've never had to go on a job interview. I've never created a CV. Still don't have a CV. So... My job history is effectively what you see on my LinkedIn profile. Oh, wow, amazing. That, and very interesting as well. Amazing that there yeah, are people who basically never had that and then still go out to build a business. And as well as <clears throat> you doing whatever it took you to become the person that you, you, are, you are now, in your quite successful um, in your part as an individual, in your career as an entrepreneur, and as well as, you know, um, hosting one of London's most famous, very, very quickly famous, you know, um, events for, for entrepreneurs, the peak performance, and uh, just quite been fortunate to have been there a couple of times as well, as well as been on your podcast yeah, as well. Yeah. So um, for entrepreneurs who are literally listening to this right now and having two sort of mindsets and say, oh yeah, you know, okay, my audience are quite very diverse, right? So literally people who basically had nothing, came to this country, had to struggle through having resident permits, you know, being 
people who basically don't know whether they could actually live here. And as well as they could be like, oh yeah, you probably, you know, you got it cheap, you got it right because it's your country. You know, this is your country, you're British, you're white. You probably had the privilege of, of you know, building a business and getting all that support. But you just said, no, this, this is, that's not the true story. The true story is you also have a journey. And this is something sometimes because when you when you look between the ethnic minorities and you look at those that own the country themselves, there are obviously different sides to the coin, isn't there? There's two different ways to skin the car. It doesn't mean that you're born here, you're raised here, your life is easy, or I immigrated here, my life is easy. But for those who are kind of, kind of there's this stereotyping in, in the whole sort of business wealth creation mindset and all of these things. Yeah, it could be also hard for a black man, means it's also hard for a white man. It could be also hard for Definitely. an Asian man, means that's going to be hard for them. What is your mindset around, you know, the actual wealth journey and, you know, success journey and actually become the greatest version of yourself, regardless of the color of your skin? I, I'm a true believer that people that put, put excuses out there because of where they're from, where their family are from, what colour their skin is, where they live in the country, whatever it is, it's just all noise, and it's it's where you choose where you are is where you choose to be. Like I know people that live up north in not very nice areas, maybe working working man towns and stuff like that, but they've gone on to be successful because they've changed the circles of their uh, circles of friends, so they've changed their circle of influence. So I think I think it doesn't matter where you. You come from it's where where you see yourself going and then you just have tunnel vision for that i mean like my family we're not white british my mum was born in cyprus my grandparents were born in uh, egypt so although i look white there is that element of an argument that i'm a i'm a foreigner in this country as well mm. but to be fair that never comes into my mind because as far as i'm concerned it it is equal opportunities and I get I get it. I have a lot of black friends and we've had these conversations before that people of black colour do feel that sometimes they have less opportunities around and there are limitations and stuff. But then if we look at the world, there are plenty of black successful people that don't believe that and because they don't believe that, they are successful. So I think if you have that limiting belief that the same opportunities aren't open to you, guess what? They're not going to be open to you because you've already convinced yourself they're not open to you. If you convince yourself that nobody's going to stop you, regardless of where you're from, your background, the fact that I've never produced a CV and nobody's ever seen or I've never documented what I achieved in my GCSEs. Anyone that says you need good GCSEs to go and get a good job now, it's rubbish. I didn't do badly in my GCSEs, but not where you're from and everything like that doesn't prevent you from setting up a successful business yourself. You don't need to be reliant on someone accepting who you are and where you've come from and give you that job. If the job isn't there, create it. I love that mentality of what you said in terms of if the job isn't there, create it. I, you know, I kind of agree with you on that because um, once upon a time, you know, for me, I, I, when I came to this country, I had all different types of jobs, linear jobs, you name it, from, you know, you know, basically wanting to go back to Africa, went back, came back, you know, and to start all over again. Well, I, I say something because I, I had had a guest previously on a previous episode and he said to me, no, no, it, it does exist that the fact that, you know, anyone who look like you, you know, will get will get more opportunities if they chase it harder for, or or the opposite or someone who looks like myself will take 10 times more. And I actually agreed with him. I said, yes, you're right. Because as a Daniel Moses, for example, mm. it's pure English name. So if, if, if someone heard my name and they haven't actually, you know, don't know the color of my skin, the door will easier, easily, easily open that if I was to introduce my middle name, you know, which is Aru. And people will be like, okay, now we can tell it's not white, it's, it's, it's not English, or whatever the case might be. And there are a lot of people that this is basically held back, all right? Because, yes, it's the mind that to become anything that you want to become in life, it's in your mind, yeah, not the color of your skin, not, not the uh, uh, you know, not the um, 
you know, information that you're used to or whatsoever the case. It's just basically an ambition. And if you pursue in the right environment, you can get support. But when, when we had that conversation and we deep down a little bit into it, we kind of both agree that in the end that as a privilege, you know, as a as the color of your skin or what you look like or being born here or speaking a certain way could actually give you more privilege above above others. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think one one thing to say about that as well is if you look at that privilege as being a comfort zone, we all know that things that come easy to you, you, you take for granted. <laughs> so I think sometimes what what you're saying is the hardship that you've had to face in order to get to where you are because of where you're from and the colour of your skin is actually a benefit to you because it's given you a stronger mindset than the person that was given the opportunity without having to work hard for it as well. Yeah. So I think you could both be in the same business, but because you've had to come up with a stronger mentality and they've had it given to them a bit easier, you're probably in a much stronger position mindset-wise and also work ethic as well. And chances are you'll probably go on to be more successful in my eyes. So I think anyone that's found it easy at the start is going to be quite complacent. I totally agree with you, to be honest, on that, because anyone that finds an easy go, easy comes, right? Easy come, easy goes, they say, right? So just to kind of, you know, moving away from that topic of the colours or, you know, our races, because the reason why I really wanted to kind of dwell a little bit on that is as you go through the journey that you are at, you know, you and I are on, you host events and I host events and I've been to a couple of your events and we can read the room and we can see who's in it. And the reason why I wanted to go into that in terms of the privileges, people said to, to you know, once upon a time, even to today, people still say yeah. to me, oh, Dr. Daniel Moses, yes, you're quite successful in what you're doing, property, you know, and people still tell me, oh, how did you do it? Because what you're doing is not for us. Mm. Like, you're trying to be one of the most successful out there in property. You're announcing what you do and sharing all this information. It's not for people like us. I'm like, no, it is for everyone. Same way in your industry, yeah, right? In your community, in your environment as well, there might be people who are, you know, we had that conversation the other day. It was like, sometimes our people don't want to pay us. Sometimes our people don't see the value in what we produce. Sometimes when you talk about mindset, people you know, always think they don't have, you know, it's nothing to do with mindset. And I say, actually, success, depending on where you're coming from, how you look at regardless, to be successful is 90% the power of your mind. Yeah. If you're not good, your business isn't going to be good. So your mind controls everything. Uh, but like you mentioned, color of skin and that, but it's also culture as well, isn't it? Like different cultures will view mindset differently as well they'll view success differently if you look at the british culture people hate on successful people but if you look at american culture people love it and they want to know what you did and they congratulate you and i just think there's so many things that come into play as to why people have these limited beliefs it's not just one thing but i think the biggest thing as i said before it is that circle of influence you have around you and by going to these events like we like we both host as well, you're putting yourself in a room with however many are there, 100, 200 like-minded people, and they may be the people that you don't currently have around you. So what what do they say? Don't, don't discuss big ideas with small-minded people. Yeah. Unfortunately, those small-minded people might be your spouse. They might be your family. They might be your school friends. It might be whoever you spend the most time with. And you can still spend time with those people, but they're not the people to talk about the big ideas because they're not in the same arena as you are. By going to these networking events and just being around like-minded people because that's who go to these events. Nobody's going to go there if they're not there for that particular topic. That's how you can forge really strong relationships. Like we, we forged our relationship yep. from you coming to our event. That was our first instance of, of a connection, and that's a year ago now. Yeah. And look how much we've done within that year. But if you never would have come to that event, you never would have met me, I never would have met you, and we wouldn't be sitting here where we are today. So I think a lot of people need to 
put themselves in uncomfortable situations and put themselves in those rooms whereby you feel difficult. Like, for instance, you've, you've mentioned that race, like maybe when you first came here, putting yourself in a room that was predominantly older white men who come from that mindset of the 60s and the 70s was probably uncomfortable for you. But now your, I go into your room, your room is predominantly black people. Yep. I don't feel uncomfortable in that situation because if you come to my event, my event is probably a strong 50-50 split because that's the kind of environment that I feel comfortable in. Yep. And it's like you said, putting yourself in an environment where it doesn't matter if you're black, white, Indian, Asian, African, you're 17 or 67, we're all on that same journey together. Mm. And there's no reason why we can or can't do business. And I don't know if you met the, the, the kid, I spoke about him on another podcast, but there's this 17 year old boy going around to all the different property events at the moment. And he was at our event. And I just think it's absolutely commendable at his age when you, you've got a young son as well and like see your son at the events and I just think it's commendable but typically what a 17 year old kid's doing right now they're playing online on computer games talking to people that they're never ever going to meet or they're out causing trouble in the park or whatever it might be that they're doing so to see someone who's decided he feels comfortable to be in a room yeah. where the average age is maybe 30 mm -hmm. and they're all business owners and they're all successful to be able to create an event space like that where somebody feels comfortable to start their journey off, I think it it's hitting home at how important that is as well. 100%. You know, when I started my journey, I remember when I got the revolution, I was about to crash my car and I fell asleep and I slept and I there's a whole story about how that happened. And I still remember because of the reason why I'm trying to lead this conversation the way it's going is I remember when I paid £70 to go into that networking event in central London, Trafalgar Square, I was the only black man. The first thing that hit me hard was, no, this, this is not the room for you. Yeah. This is not the room for you, Daniel. And then the second thing was, after I left that event, I was on a Sunday in a church and we, I, was, I, left, I left church, church is closed and I'm driving in the car uh, with my friend from church and we had in a chat and I'm like, I was in this networking event, I'm going to become a property. And he said to me, oh, what I'm trying to do at that time, so it's not for, oh, he actually spoke in Pigeon English, local Nigerian language, that oh boy, and I'll speak it, he says, oh boy, oh, that's another work for, for people like us, so now Igbo people. So it means that basically whatever I was trying to do at that time wasn't for black people, it was for white people, it was for Asian people. Yeah. And, and like you said, environment when you're in this sort of other environment where black, white, Asian, regardless that of the color of your skin, comes together now, yeah, all right, we're producing. Look at where we are now, like you said a yeah. year ago. But the reason why this is so important is I know a lot of people my color, people Asian, and all these different you know race in this country thinking, oh, we can't do this, we can't because it's not for us. And this is where I want to drive this to, you know, because it's quite a very uncomfortable conversation to have because a lot of people might want to be politically correct all the time and not having deep conversations like this. But there are a lot of people who are black who would never have the guts, you know, to literally have a communication with a white man, an Asian man, thinking, oh, they have a certain way of looking at things. But I think it's so important that as we go on this journey on entrepreneurship, to literally find a way to actually overcome and destroy that barrier. And I, I can be very aggressive in how I use that word because yes, you have to destroy that barrier to entry thinking that this is not for you. It's only for certain people yeah. because we all have what it takes to really build it, don't we? I think, I think the one thing I've experienced through life is, is that a lot of people have a chip on their shoulder about race and they actually attract that drama to them so I'll give you an example. When I was employing for Casita, I employed two boys locally and they were both mixed race boys. And after two weeks of working with me, one of the boys actually said to me, can I ask you a question? It's been playing on my mind. And I went, of course. And he said, why did you employ two boys that were mixed raced? And I just looked at him and I just said, that's the most ridiculous question you've ever asked me. Mm. And that doesn't deserve an answer because for me, 
race didn't play a part in it. Like it was, you came forward. I interviewed a couple of people. You two were the most suitable for the job. But in his head, for those two weeks that I've been training him up, what was playing in his mind is, why is this white guy employed two mixed races as if there was an agenda to it? And mm. it just made me think about the youth today that because of what historically has happened and what's being said maybe at home and in cultures and environments, this is why it never goes away because it's always it's still always being spoken about like it's present and it's an issue. And the more you keep telling yourself it is an issue, the more it becomes an issue. We we know the law of attraction. Whatever you talk about the most and whatever you tell yourself the most is what you attract to you. So if you're constantly talking about debt, you attract more debt. If you're constantly talking about making money, you attract more money-making opportunities. And I think if you keep telling yourself there's a problem in society, all you identify in society are the problems. But if you keep telling yourself there isn't a problem in society, I don't know what you're talking about, you'll go through life not having that problem and you'll be going out with a group of white, Asian, Indian, Chinese friends and it will never be an issue to you. So I do think in a way it's what we tell ourselves the actual issue is. And like you said, they were telling you it's not for you properly. But you were telling yourself it is and I'm going to prove you wrong and look where you are today. So I think there is a massive stigma attached to it on the narrative around what we're taught and stuff like that. And I'll give you one more example is that my my six-year-old girl, and we know six, yeah. the age six, they're very innocent, they're very naive yeah. and vulnerable. Um, they, they were celebrating, I suppose, Black History Month for a whole week at school and I actually feel like it had the opposite effect because they made such a... They made such a big deal about different skin colours and cultures that innocently she now, when she talks to me about her friends, she identifies them and their name through skin colour. Whereas previous to that, it was always their name. Yeah. And I think sometimes we can make such a big deal about it that we create the problem as well. Yeah. You know... Having said what you're saying here, you know, because it's very important that as we go through the journey to success, you know, you will encounter some of this conversation that we're having right now. And probably most people might be been thinking, what does this have to do with success? What does this have to do with wealth? What does this have to do with the journey of that transitioning? Because it's all part of the process of what yeah. makes you successful. Yeah. Right. Um, you're going to need to raise finance to build a property portfolio. You are never going to, you're never going to have enough money to build it. No. If you're not coming out to mix and cross-pollinate, you know, you're going to be stuck. So these are conversations that's never really something that people talk about, but it all forms that part to your wealth creation journey mm -hmm. that you're going to need to mix with all different kinds of people, whether at the top level or the bottom level, uh, whether through events, whether through coaching, whether through mentorship and all these different things. Yeah, everybody has different sides of their own journey. Like the, like the coin, the coin has two sides. There's different skin, you know, sides to skin a car and all these different things that has been said before. And you said it's all depend on the power of your mind. Like think of Grow Rich, the story of Edmund C. Bonds. Mm -hmm. I saw Edwin C. Bonds, the guy who never invented anything and wanted to become partner with the guy who, you know, worked with the greatest world invent inventors and his ambition and desire was to become a business partner with this, mm -hmm. you know, with this massive individual. And he did whatever he took to get there. So it's having that mindset of you basically saying, you know what, I am going to go and become regardless of what it is. Actually, even become whatever it is so you can actually attract yeah. all different types of colors. Attract all different types of world experiences to your world that no color exists because I read a book that actually said to me, there is a way you get to success and success so much that to be honest, right now in this current economy and you know the society that we now live in, it's almost like at the top level, when you rise to this food chain at the top, yeah, there could be racism or there could be color, there could be all these different issues, but it's not in your face. 
because people can't even dare to say it mm. at that level. And I kind of agree and don't, and also disagree. But you ha we have to learn to stop eliminate. We just have to learn to completely eliminate the color of our skin, do whatever, just take our mindset to doing whatever it takes to becoming successful. Yeah. You know, and just go out there to build and to build. You know, you started from nothing and now you run one of London's largest, you know, business networking event. I started from nothing. I run currently, you know, one of London's biggest, you know, wealth creation, you know, you know, events. And what we both have is we attract same, you know. Passion. Pa exactly. So what would you say has been your greatest lesson in life that, that, based on the fact that you have this different type of community around you and I also have the same community around me, what has been your greatest lesson to you becoming the greatest vision who inspires others now? I think um, networking has been probably one of the most vital things that I've done throughout business, the power of networking and building your network. And the thing is you're always building your network because the more successful you become, you need to then position yourself to be around people like you again in order to grow. So you should always be the average of your five closest friends, they say. So you've always, you're not at the bottom, but you've always got someone to aim for to overtake as well. So for me, networking firstly is one of the most important things. And I think secondly, just being true to yourself. Um, just be true to you. Don't, don't try and be like anyone else. Yeah, yeah. Don't come across fake. Be humble and just just be that person that people trust and will want to work with. Like arrogance in my eyes doesn't get you anywhere. Yeah. Might get you a few people that are impressed with it, but for me, be that be that nice guy with a set of teeth. So if someone tries to take your kindness for weakness, you have a set of teeth that you can bounce back on. But just be that likable person because people buy from people like them at the end of the day and you and I could be selling the same product and I could be selling it for £10 more but someone would rather buy from me at a higher price because they don't like you and I think that's the main thing is you have to be likeable for people to buy into it now it's not about a brand it's not about a logo it's not even about the product it's about the person behind it and before they buy the product, they're buying you first. And we, we all know, like, you go into a shop or you go into a restaurant, and if your first impression of it is that the waitress was rude to you, I've done it many a times. I go, do you, do you want to eat here? And you look at each other and go, you know what, no, don't worry about it. And we go, okay, you know what, don't, don't worry. And you walk out. And you could have been dying to go there, and there could have been a particular thing on the menu that you really wanted to eat. Yeah. But because you didn't like that person... You didn't want to buy that product or that service. And you walked away. So I think, again, what I've learned is just be true to yourself and just position yourself to be likable and just let people feed off of the real you. Don't put up this, don't have this armor where you hide yourself away, but also don't put up this facade of this person that you think everyone wants you to be because people will see through it. They'll see the cracks that you're not being the true you. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So, yeah, I mean, while doing that, let's kind of change the topic a little bit and let's go into property. So you are now, you're a property, very successful, you know, a property consultant. Mm -hmm. You know, for those who don't really understand what property consultant is, you know, through your journey, um, having gone through all these different things that we spoke about and just kind of encouraging people who are like me, people who are like you, so we can continue now to build and cross-pollinate and work with one another in the business world because success knows no color. I believe um, it's just my mindset now, uh, but especially when you even the more you rise, yeah, you yeah. know, the more you know those things kind of fade away. And now we're living in the most diverse world right now. And if you know how to navigate it correctly, the world is your is literally your oyster. So you founded the you know the the the, the Casita, Cas Casita, you know, Casita, yeah. sorry, Casita. I was gonna I was gonna be wrong <laughs> with that name again. So the Casita Property Group, you yeah. founded that, and. And as well as you co-founded the Peak Performance, sorry, uh, business partner yeah. with the with the Peak Performance, and as we're having Lord Sugar as one of your you know current sponsor. Mm -hmm. So from a guy who was literally you know living in the roughest part of town in Kent, 
looking back to your achievement in you know as a property consultant yeah. you know as a event you know for business and those who are looking to literally transition you know their mindset and all of that looking backwards now talking about property there as a property consultant what sort of solutions you actually provide and you know and how does that help you impact your yeah your, your clients so i think i think the the, the first thing to say is that before I was in property, I, I was I was in sales and I was heavily involved in um, high high energy sales. And the training that I went through um, was something that I became really passionate about. So I went on a two day training course with Jordan Belfort. I went through training with Brian Tracy, Les Brown. Um, some really, really big names, and I became obsessed with sales training and mindset and personal development. Fast forward five years, and I decided property was what I wanted to go into. One thing I knew is that I didn't want to be an estate agent or a letting agent. And what it was about was looking at the current state of the market and identifying a pain point in order to create a service that I felt wasn't available in the market. And that that pain point for me was that estate agents just weren't able to sell tenanted properties effectively because you as a landlord, you you know that you're looking to sell a property or even if you want access to a property, it can be quite difficult sometimes getting the tenants to set up a time and a date with you and stuff like that. So when you've got an estate agent booking 20 viewings with a tenant, it before long, the tenant's going to get a bit unhappy and they're going to stop answering the phone. They're going to stop opening the door. They're going to stop paying, stuff like that. So I, identi- I identified a pain point and I built my business around what I saw as a solution to landlords that wanted to sell their properties that were tenanted. And the first thing was selling them off market. So not having it open to the whole of the country whereby you're going to be inundated with people coming in and making inquiries and there'll be loads of view-ins and time-wasting view-ins and low-ball offers and stuff like that. The second thing was to build a base of investors that were pre-qualified and that weren't going to mess us about. And the third thing, which I think is the most important, is the due diligence and the way we presented the deals. So we would employ a company to go out and do an independent property inspection on it take independent pictures and do an independent um, video walkthrough. And what that meant is different to what estate agents were doing. We weren't glossing up any pictures. We weren't glossing up any videos or saying the property was all amazing. It was an independent company doing a review of that. And if there was something wrong with it, they knew about it at the start. And the video walkthroughs would then prevent the need for lots and lots of viewings. So we created that solution and it positioned us to be one of the leading outlets for for landlords now in the country. Great. I really like how you break that down. Um, You went through from sales coaching yourself and training and mentorship and all of that. So would you then say that coaching and mentorship played a massive, massive impact in your your world as a property consultant? Yeah, I, I, I would say understanding sales is because at the end of the day, everything that we do is a, is a sale. For instance, me being on this podcast, if you hadn't sold me the idea of coming on the podcast and what it would mean for me, I wouldn't be sitting on this sofa and anybody else that comes through it, whatever it might be, everything is a sale. Either you're selling a product or a service to someone or they're selling you a reason why they they, they shouldn't buy from you. So I think having that understanding of sales at the start meant that whatever product or service that I went on to do from that, I had that foundation of knowing it's irrelevant. I know how to sell anything. And for me, knowing that the first thing you should do in a business is understand who your end client is and then work backwards as opposed to thinking, what product should I sell? There's no point creating a product or a service that nobody wants or nobody will buy for. So going back to it, this is who my ideal client is. What are my ideal client's biggest problems? What can I build service or product-wise that can provide a solution 
to those people. And that's how I learned when I was doing sales to, to how to sell, basically. So that was the biggest thing that I would take from my sales experience is that I knew from an early age how to build a business. And it was the same with the events company. From all the events that we go to, yeah. what did we like? What didn't we like? And what do we think the people that attended both of those events would yeah. like to see? Yeah. And then we created it, the events company that way. Wow. I really I really see the entrepreneurial mindset here and a mindset that is endless with creativity. And obviously you said um, basically working backwards. I mean, I've always said is you have to know where you're going because if you don't know where you're going, you end up driving everywhere. Yeah. Just like jumping in a car and you just feel you need like a driving. Destination. You, need a, you need a destination. Yeah. But whilst you're going through that destination, you need to understand what the journey is. Yeah. And go through that journey. And above all, enjoy that journey. Because if you don't enjoy the journey, you're gonna quit. Right? You're gonna quit and you you're gonna if you if you don't understand what the sales part of it is, again, you're not you're gonna you you're gonna end up doing so many things and not generating an income for yourself, right? So for example, in sales, right, you have to have a product that you need to sell. Like you mentioned, you need to, to come to this podcast and what is in it for you and what isn't it for me. But from the get-go, it might not sometimes, lo, you know, logically, it might not be what is in it for you and what is not in it for you, but it's just you understanding how business works. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you understanding business works means, okay, I'm coming to this Wealth and Business podcast. People are going to listen to it. All right. And uh, and uh, as well as it's, it's a great for me to just kind of have, have a decent conversation on what goes in and out of a business that I want to share with the people who are the listeners. Because a lot of people get into property, get into businesses, but don't understand in all the different backends that need to be tied together. Because the one intention only for business people usually is all about the money, not thinking long term. And this is one of the reasons why the property industry is being is being one of the most bastardized industry when it comes to coaching, mentorship, and all of these things. Because you have people who are selling that you're going to become successful today, not tomorrow, today. And people get into it and they realize actually there's work to be done. Doesn't happen that quick. There's a work to be done. I, I recall so so I was in the studio a couple of weeks ago and we were recording a lot of short form content. And one of the things that I spoke about was a quote that I heard, which was the person that enjoys the journey more than the person that enjoys the destination will have the most success. And what I got from that is the person that says they want to become a millionaire, they want to be a millionaire and they're only focused on the being a millionaire, the destination. They're not thinking about the, the bit in between. The only thing they're focused on is being a millionaire but the person that enjoys the journey of becoming a millionaire, so they are focused on the destination, but they but they enjoy that journey, the ups, the downs, potentially two businesses going under before they find that successful business. That person who enjoys the journey more than the destination is the person that will become the most successful. That, for me, hit the nail on the head because that's how I feel my journey's been. I've had businesses that have done really well and I've had businesses that haven't. I've had business partners that I've worked well with and I've had business partners that have screwed me over for money. But I've enjoyed the journey because I only ever make a mistake once. And I don't class it as a mistake. I class it as a learning experience. It's a mistake if I make it twice. So for me, that that journey has been stressful, but it's been enjoyable because I've had a very, very kind of creative journey towards entrepreneurship but I'm still I'm still focused on being successful and entrepreneurship and getting to the destination but that's not the most important to, thing to me right now the most important thing for me is just enjoying what I'm doing and the journey wow you really broke that down really well enjoy the journey but can people enjoy the journey as well as while they're focusing on the destination because I think for me, I, I I do both. I'm yeah. very well focused on my destination. And as well as I enjoy the journey. Everything. Work don't feel like work for me. And this is one of the reasons why, like, where yeah. we are now is my office as well as my studio. And I don't have to leave this century, I call it. I call it a century because I get a lot of inspiration at night, daytime, just being in this environment. And 
for me, I enjoy the journey because it don't feel like work. Mm -hmm. And I focus on the destination through the journey because I'm like, oh, wow, I'm close. I'm close every single day. And I, as well as I also look at where I'm going, to, you know, where I'm coming from, especially as my journey of just coming to a foreign country, you know, and, you know, getting all to the, you know, all the way the, to the to the top. Yeah. And just basically doing that. So I do both. So for those who are listening right now, do you think also it's, there are people who might just want to, people might say, oh, I don't want to, I'm focused on the journey. I'm focused on the destination. Is that oh, I don't want to be distracted. I just want to focus on the journey. So what was your take on that? Can you focus on the journey and can you also yeah, focus on the destination? I think you can. And I think the destination will always change as well mm. because I personally don't think I will ever hit the, de the destination. <laughs> the reason I don't is because I think every time I get close to the destination, I will need to change the destination to keep me going. Yeah. Um, and again, that's through an experience that I've had. Um, like I said to you, it's only a mistake if you make it more than once. But I know that when I was buying my first house, I was the most driven. I had that destination. And along that destination, the journey was, um, it was a new build house. So it was, right, I need first fix done here. So I need this amount of money there. And I was earning the most money that I'd ever earned. And I was doing really well. But when I completed on that house and I moved into it, my earnings went down straight away because I then didn't have another destination. And I think the biggest mistake that I had was allowing myself to arrive to that destination and becoming complacent. So now my view is when you're getting close to the destination, change the destination so that you can carry on going. I mean, my very good friend here, um, Thomas, Eric Thomas says, when you get to the Martin, set a bigger mountain. When you get to the Martin, set another bigger one. But isn't that, you know, you said something earlier in England, people are very negative when it comes to money, when it comes to wealth, when it comes to success. People are quite very negative about, especially when you're very outspoken about greatness and success and all these different things. People just dislike you. They think you would be arrogant. Now, isn't that a situation where, for example, people say you're not content with what you have because at every given point in time, you think you're enjoying the journey and obviously when you get to the destination, you set a new destination and you just adjust a little bit. Wouldn't that then be the reason why people have this negative mindset around successful people and say, oh, successful people are greedy, successful uh, people are just this or that? I think you've got different people in, in the world. You've got... Um, Again, I'll refer to Aaron. Aaron's out there doing street interviews at the moment, talking about would you rather be self-employed or employed? And it's a 50-50 mix, the people he talks to, because half of the people he talks to say, I'd never want to be employed because I wouldn't want my life and my money being in somebody else's hands. Then you get the people saying, oh, no, business is too risky and I'd, I'd much prefer the guaranteed wage that I get every single month. Yeah, For me... You've got people in life that are content with going to work and somebody else having the stress of running a business and they can have their six weeks holiday every year, they can get their sick pay, they can get their nine to five and they'll retire with a state pension. But then you've got people like you and I who aren't content with that and we can't sit still and we always want more and when we get close to our destination, we want a better destination we're always wanting to grow. And it's like I was saying to Kevin earlier, is that for me, I'm not excited about money anymore in my property business. Like our typical commission is is over £10,000. Doesn't excite me. But what excites me right now is gaining new sponsorship for the events company, getting our next guest speaker confirmed for the events company. It's something new. It's something exciting. I feel like with the property company, I've arrived I've arrived at my destination and it does what it needs to and it pays the bills and it provides the bread and butter. But I get to a point where I have to move on to something else. So this time last year, it was the podcast. Now, the podcast is doing really, really well. Now it's time to focus on the events company and now it's time to focus on the mentorship. So for me, I'll be that guy that probably will struggle to retire unless I have something that I really want to do in retirement I'll probably get bored. 
Well, then again, so this is some level of what you just said now, as we draw towards this end of this episode, you said, so it was a podcast, it was the event, now it's a mentorship. But a lot of people probably would do that a bit wrongly in terms of doing different niches. So yeah. we're, we're currently here enjoying this conversation and obviously, hopefully our audience, we kind of pick a lot of nuggets from this because quite conversational of, of the journey yeah. of that entrepreneurship, right? That transitioning from the ordinary to the extraordinary and all the key components that is involved in it, your mindset, your action, your knowledge, you know, confidence is even speaking because not a lot of people can acquire the, the gift of being yeah. able to speak. So that that sort of mindset that you need to have, you know, rather than doing different things in different forms, but doing different things in the same form. So yeah. peak performers is entrepreneurship and business and branding and social media. You know, you know, your podcast is the same thing. You know, the only thing that's a bit separate a little bit is the property side. Yeah. But then again, it keys into that because you have guests on your platform that are also property investors. Yeah. So it's all tied in, isn't it? That's it. It's everything interlinks nicely. So it all started from Casita. Casita sponsored the podcast. Casita got exposure from the podcast. And then from the podcast, we created the events company. The events company gives Casita exposure because I'm the host. It gives the podcast a bigger audience. So people come to the event that don't know about the podcast, they follow it. And then the mentorship interlinks with the property company. It interlinks with what we stand for for the podcast and and also the events company. So all of them are connected. And like you said, cross-pollinating, we, we cross-sell everything. So someone comes to the event, they might want mentorship or they might be ideal as someone to come on the podcast or they might just be a new subscriber to the podcast they could be a landlord they could be an investor it's it's people from all walks of life so we for me if it all of a sudden a new business was creating a laundrette for instance that would be so detached from what i'm doing it would be more of a distraction than a business opportunity unless i was completely passive from it and i didn't need to be involved I wouldn't do something like that. It all has to work together because like you and I, there's only so many hours in a day. Yeah. And what we choose to do with that day has to be the right thing for return on investment. Mm. But the fact is, I know whatever I do for whatever business in that day, in some way, it will come back round to all the other businesses. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, Mr. Paul has been absolutely amazing. You know, just sitting down here on the sofa, and just basically having this great conversation. Definitely, definitely, there's going to be me bringing you back. And I'm so excited as well that you 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 are also going to be one of our future guests, you know, at our multiple events that we host here at the Wealth and Business and Plus Prop 2 of Education. So I'm really looking forward to uh, us literally sharing one simple message of that ordinary transition into the extraordinary because we all have greatness within us, don't we? Yeah, you... you you just got to get it out of you. And that could be reading a book. That could be watching a podcast. It could be going to an event. It could be anything. Everyone's got it in them. It's just whether or not they, they're able to get it out. Yeah, absolutely. So Paul has been absolutely, absolutely, like, I'm so super fired up to, to have you on this episode of the Wealth and Business Podcast. I'm looking forward to our future collaborations, cross-pollination and what such not. Um, yeah, any final words? If there, if I was to ask you right now, for those who are listening, especially for those who are at the beginning of their journey, who who has developed a clouded mindset to greatness, what would that one, actually three, what would that last, what would that three advice be? I would say one, pick up a good book and just, Focus on on a book. Don't focus on any of the negativity around you. So social media, what's going on in the world, it's all quite negative at the moment. Pick up a good book, get your mindset right. Secondly, like we said before, don't talk about your plans to small-minded people because they're only going to hold you back. And three, take action. Wow. Amazing. 
And it, it's it, you just kind of got me off my feet there because there's a quote that I use, I live by, never go to the wrong person for the right advice. No disrespect to your mom or dad, if your mom or your dad never created a billion pound business and you have an ambition and a goal and you think you have what it takes for you to build a billion pound business, then your mom and your dad would not be the right person to take you on that journey. Because if you do create that journey, it's going to have an impact on them. Positive one, for example, or a successful business entrepreneur who the society can become proud of. So your role would be to find someone that's got that thing that so passionately that you want to help you grow who you want to become. So on a nutshell, it means never go to the wrong person for the right advice. If you're looking to be successful in your marriage, why should you go to someone who's never been married before to give you an advice about marriage? You want to find someone that's been in marriage 10, 20, 40, 50 years so they can share their success, their, their, their roller coaster, the emotional trauma that goes through keeping a good marriage so they can share it with you so you can actually go and build a good marriage. So, yeah, and Paul is quite right. So make sure you just kind of remember this. All right, if, if you forget every other thing else, all right, don't go to small-minded people to discuss your big ambition and as well as don't ever go to the wrong person for the right advice. So thank you so much for listening and watching this podcast. I've just for those of you who might not remember or you forget, if you want to grow your mindset, you want to grow your wealth, you want to get go on this wealth journey, um, please make sure you click on the link somewhere around this podcast where you have access to my free property masterclass, wealth creation masterclass, and as well, the wealth and podcast networking events is also around the corner every now and then and it's in collaboration with this podcast so if, for those of you who want to come and meet paul in person uh he's he's going to be one of our upcoming guests because the podcast and the networking events interlink to one another so we're looking forward to seeing you at the live events as well so take care and yeah stay blessed see you soon take care see you then fantastic